I'm getting off of the boat. I mean, the boat is sinking. It's it's destroyed. It's self imploded. If you believe the right or you believe the left, you believe a lie. Neither one of them are telling you the truth. They're both destroying the nation. They're both driving up the national debt. They're both destroying the dollar. They're both destroying our culture. This week's specials with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. 2022 Gold Britannias for only $79 over spot. And 2022 Silver Britannias for only $369 over spot. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend Jerry Robinson from followthemoney.com. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us today. Elijah, it's an honor. Great to be here. It's great to have you. And what I wanted to discuss today is how the House did pass a debt ceiling resolution or a quick fix, I guess you could say. It, now it's essentially just postponed till December as long as the president uh, signs it. So your perspective on this, and I know you wrote the book Bankruptcy of Our Nation, and it seems like every time we hear about the debt ceiling, it always gets resolved, but it always brings up the issue that the U.S. is bankrupt, essentially, in your perspective. So if you could kind of, what are your thoughts on the whole situation right now? Well, Elijah, I wish that the U.S. was bankrupt just in my perspective. You know, I wish that's what it was. I mean, we have a $28 trillion national debt. We have a $3 trillion deficit, annual deficit. And we're not really able to pay our bills without borrowing. And um, if, if anybody else were in this, cir- in this circumstance, if anybody else had this balance sheet, we would call them bankrupt. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. They, there does seem to be this case where the U.S. has earning potential. So you might look at someone who is in this situation and say, well, can they earn money? Do, can they go get a job? Can they improve their finances? In the case of the United States, the, the math is so overwhelmingly against uh, us that there's simply no way to dig ourselves out of this hole, especially when you consider the unfunded obligations, right? So the unfunded obligations are just hundreds of trillions of dollars, and there's no plan to pay for them. I mean, for example, Social Security recipients just received a nice 6% increase in their uh, monthly benefits. That's going to begin in January. That's about 70 million people. And thank goodness. I mean, thank goodness they're getting a, a hike because senior citizens right now are faced with rising grocery prices, rising gas prices, rising medical care costs like you haven't seen before, rising prescription costs, and and uh, the inflation's out through the roof. But when you really look at the inflation rate, Shadow Stats did a great uh, analysis and shows that the, instead of that 6% boost for Social Security recipients, it really should be closer to 14%. When you really look at the CPI, the CPI is fudged, of course, for the benefit of the government so that they don't have to raise payments as quickly as they really should. So, uh, yeah, I wrote the book Bankruptcy of Our Nation. That book, I encourage everybody to pick it up, read it. It's a, it's a very important book. Give it to somebody you love. Give it to somebody, you, you, you know, a friend or a family member. Uh, help wake them up to see what's happening. We have to, to take care of our own. This has been our message since the beginning, Elijah, is that I'm not waiting around for Washington to fix itself, right? Some people are. Some people are bound and determined to get another guy into office. This guy will fix it. You know, this party will fix it. You know, this is insane. It's total insanity. It's, it's uh, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So I have no hope in any political party. I have no hope that Washington is going to get its act together. What I've done is I've moved out of the city. I did this many years ago. You know this. We've talked about this before. I moved out of the city. I was living in a big, large city. And I just left because I realized that bad stuff is coming. And look what's happening now. I mean, we're seeing it unfold right before our very eyes. So I, before real estate's you know prices went through the roof, we went out, we found ourselves a nice piece of land, nice acreage, water, uh, you know, water sources on the, la- on the land. We built a garden. We are getting off the grid. We've been doing this for years, and we're seeing things break down before our eyes. This is what we've been teaching our students to be, be prepared for. So best place to start to get that is just read that book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. You can find it on Amazon or wherever else. It's just literally 
it's literally just filled with information that is not going to be vote for this person or, you know, Washington needs to do this. Washington's not going to do anything, right? They're not going to do anything until they absolutely positively have to, just like with the debt ceiling, just like you brought up. The debt ceiling is a perfect example. They twiddle their thumbs and they use it against each other until the very last second. That's exactly what they're going to do with your social security benefits. That's exactly what they're going to do with your Medicare benefits. That's exactly what they're going to do with everything else that they do because it's all a political game to these stooges. So we can't put our faith, hope and trust in government. Government cannot save you. They will not save you. You have to take control of your own finances. And in that book, we also taught, we lay out several different ways that you can, you know, break free financially. We even have on our website completely free follow the money.com forward slash five levels are five levels of financial freedom. People can go through and see, uh, you know, how we actually broke free financially. So yeah, the debt ceiling is, you know, it's, it's almost moot anymore. It's just a ridiculous joke. Uh, Washington has no plan. You have to have a plan if you want to thrive in this environment. You mentioned relocating outside the city. In your perspective, with what's coming, why is the city not going to be a maybe even safe place to live? Well, when we first moved out of the city, uh, I felt that being away from the city was a street, it was a strategic relocation for us. We even did a podcast about it, kind of laid out the different ideas, did a webinar for our members about it too, just kind of showing why we were doing this. And the, so we moved to a town that is much smaller, much, much smaller. And in fact, we're actually in a rural area and we really like it. It's been great. It's been great for our children too. Our children are seeing that food doesn't come from grocery stores. They see, you know, that you, you actually grow, you can grow your own food. You know, we're trying to teach them another way. I'm not impressed at all with what our youngsters are learning today in our society. I mean, I think it's really debaucherous and I think it's a, a very negative influence. So we we're trying to bring our kids up in a different way and living away from the city is one way to do that. Uh, but of course the internet, you can't protect them from that, of course, forever. Uh, so at initially I thought that moving away from the larger city to a rural area in the United States would be wise. And it has been wise, Elijah, but I am increasingly moving to the place where I believe that I'm going to have to leave this country. Uh, so we're actually considering a move out of the country and we're looking at various, various, uh, different, you know, other countries right now. Um, and that's a really tough, that's a tough thing because you have family here, of course, here in the United States, but, uh, it's, it's coming to the place, Elijah, where, the chaos here is just the noise here is so loud. It's so ridiculous that being away from this country, the few times, you know, I've been out of, I've been out of the country, well, actually several times. And every time I do, I notice that the noise level goes down in my life, right? It's always, when I come back, it's just, it's wild. So getting away from this society, I think is something that appeals to me. And, uh, and so while I would advocate for anyone who's thinking about relocating to get out of the city, because the city itself is is where you have – it's really uh, unsustainable. You have too many people living in too small or dense of, a, of an area demanding too many goods. And what we see with the supply chain, for example, people who live in the city are greatly dependent upon the supply chain. They're greatly dependent upon you know, uh, the grid in that city. And I think getting out of the city not only is emotionally and mentally helpful, but it also can actually have practical applications. You actually begin to, you know, think about how to get off the grid and how to maybe become less dependent upon the grid and the supply chain. So, you know, that's my that's my statement. But I would I would say that I'm even moving more towards leaving the country itself. And and we talk about that on our podcast quite quite often. And do you have any specific locations you're looking at outside the country? Sure. Yeah, we've been looking at uh, New Zealand. New Zealand is a, a place where I've had a few friends who've moved there. Uh, I There are a lot of attractive places in Mexico 
Um, however, the legal system there, I cannot get my head around it. So we've kind of ruled out Mexico for now, although I know there's a lot of great areas in Mexico that would make sense. Canada, uh, to a certain extent, I know I have many Canadian friends. Some of them tell me do not move here. Uh, and I, I understand that, but there, there's also some areas of Canada that make some sense to me as well. Uh, certain parts of Europe, uh, not all, but certain parts of Europe are also attractive. So there's just a handful, but I think leading the the list right now is New Zealand. And then your perspective on besides relocation, what are some prudent steps that people should be taking? I know we've talked on this channel you know, often about investing in precious metals to safeguard your finances, but what are some things that you're doing that maybe some people wouldn't immediately think of? Hmm, that's a good question. So, so right now, uh, when you look at our overall investment portfolio, uh, we are probably about 55% of our total investment portfolio. And, and, and I should actually s scratch that and say it this way, 55% of our investment dollars on a regular basis that are going into investments are going into hard assets. But that doesn't mean gold and silver only. Uh, gold and silver are a component of that. In fact, they make up around about 10 to 15 percent of it. We also have recently begun adding diamonds, uh, uh, investment grade diamonds to our portfolio in that hard a asset mix. But a full 40 percent of those hard assets that we're buying are real estate and specifically residential real estate. Um, three bedroom, two bathroom homes in an area where we're at now, where cost of living is low, where uh, the housing prices are not sky high. I'm not buying condos on the beach in Miami. You know, I'm, I'm buying three bedroom, two bathroom homes in blue collar, hardworking neighborhoods that are affordable, sustainable, that I could, I could make the mortgage payment on them if I had to, if there was nobody living there, they're affordable. And also where the rent you can fetch for them, you know, it gives you a nice, uh, room of, you know, wiggle room of about three or $400. So you have a nice margin there. Um, that's really where we've been putting about 40 cents out of every investment dollar is residential real estate. We've been doing that for a while now. It provides a great yield. Um, and then of course we do have money in stocks. Uh, we have about 15, well, right now about 20% of our total investment dollars going into stocks. Uh, we also invest in businesses. Uh, I think that's a really great way to, for people to uh, invest. I won't get too into details about that. Maybe we could do a separate podcast on that, but ways that you can actually invest and become a venture capitalist with very little money. I have some really interesting strategies on that that we teach our members and students. But if you have a small amount of money, but you still want to try to uh, get a good yield on it by investing in businesses, local businesses in particular, there are ways. And uh, that's been a really successful thing. Um, yeah. So I, I would say those are some of the areas, you know, that we're invested in. And of course, investing in education, investing in yourself, you know, and investing in our children. We homeschool our children. Uh, and that's been a wonderful return to see. And in the environment that we're heading into, you've talked about how it's important to really diversify not only your assets, but your streams of income. So if you lose a couple, you're still going to be able to provide for your family. So if you could expand on that, like some maybe ideas for people to really branch out and explore new areas with respect to where they're getting their money. So we have an income university on our website, followthemoney.com. And there we talk about 22 different income streams that people can create both now and in retirement. And we go through each one of them we have videos and PDFs and education. So let me just tell you some of what they are. I mean, we have, of course, there's always ways to boost for example, like this is the most obvious one for most people, but everybody who is working is going to get a social security check. So most people who aren't receiving social security don't think about it. They're like, well, you know, I probably won't even get it. And maybe you won't. Right. But for those who are getting near to social, social security income, they're probably going to receive it. Of course, it'll still be around, even though it's going to be diminished in the coming years. So there's ways to boost your Social Security income in retirement. And we talk about really cool strategies for that. There's also, you know, you, have, you may have a pension from work. You may have a 401k at work. We talk about ways to really maximize those as well. Your IRA can provide an income, specifically Roth IRAs. We really like the Roth component because then you get tax-free income. Tax-free income is going to be big considering the big tax tsunami that's coming at us. Tax rates 
are lower now. The the actual mar, uh, mar, top marginal tax rates are lower now than they've been in decades. And most people don't really want to hear that. They think, well, no, taxes are higher than they've ever been. And when you add up all the tolls and fees and state taxes and local taxes, I mean, obviously we do face a massive tax burden and taxes are high. But when you actually look at the actual income tax itself, that that number is historically very low. And that means that it's going to go higher over time. And this really builds the case for anyone in the audience, whether you're a young man or you're a young woman out there listening to this, and you're putting away money. A, you should be putting away money uh, to store away that purchasing power for later use. But if you're going to store it away, try to find a tax-free box that you can put it into. And the Roth IRA offers that. That's just one of them. Now, there's about five different tax-free uh, boxes that you can put it in that I can think of off the top of my head. And we're going to be doing a big webinar on that topic of tax-free income really soon for our for our folks. But you know, when it comes to uh, Roth IRAs, I would strongly consider, uh, urge people, younger people especially, to consider that, to look into it. I'm no CPA. It may not be right for you, but I like the Roth IRA for creating tax-free income. Of course, you can build dividend income. Of course, you can build uh, income from, you know, uh, wholesaling real estate. Some people don't, some people really, some of our members, Elijah, do really well by wholesaling real estate in this environment. So that's where you don't actually have enough money or you just don't want to buy a house, but you're the, you're the connector. So you connect the buyer and the seller and they do this with a really simple system of putting out signs. You might've seen, I buy house signs, most of these people don't actually buy the house. They're actually the connector. They're looking for somebody who wants to sell, and then they have a list of buyers. So we have some members at Follow the Money here who do that very successfully and make very good money, and that's a nice income. It can be a part-time income, a full-time income. Uh, you know, there's also you know covered call income. You can use options to create regular income from the stocks that you already own. You can rent those out. Uh, affiliate marketing is another very powerful income stream that people can develop. And there's referral marketing, which we teach a lot about. So, I mean, there's just so many different ways, Elijah. We could just go through all of them and, and uh, not have enough time in the whole day to, to talk about them. But, yeah, there's so many different ways. And I want to encourage people to develop multiple streams of income. That's what changed my life uh, was, was understanding early that it was about 25 when it dawned on me. I was working a job that I absolutely despised. And I was frustrated. Because even though I had an education, even though I felt, you know, fair, fairly reasonably educated, I was like, why am I stuck in this place where I have no time freedom? You know, I, this is, it was driving me nuts. And I realized that I was doing it wrong. You know, I was not I wasn't uh, I was trading my hours for a handful of dimes to quote the old Doors song. <laughs> and I realized that it was important to create multiple streams of income and that's what we teach. That's what we promote uh, here at followthemoney.com. It's, it's very, very important that people have that. And when they have that, Elijah, then they can have time freedom. Then they're able to pursue their callings. They're able to spend more time with their family and loved ones. I'm not talking about not working. I'm talking about ha being smart, working smart, having multiple streams of income. And it's possible for anyone. Now, I'd like to shift our focus still on the topic, though, of what is coming and preparing for what is ahead You've talked also about that there are supply shortages, and we've seen this really ever since COVID, but it could be getting worse. Your perspective on, and you mentioned how, you know, it's important to show your children that, you know, food doesn't just come from the store. You can grow it yourself and you can prepare for these kinds of things and become more self-sufficient. But why in particular do you see that there are risks of further supply shortages in the future? Well, you know, I don't know how bad it's going to get. I know it's pretty bad right now. The troubles are here in the supply chain, and it's complicated by rising inflation, and that, of course, many people just up and leaving their jobs. We had 4.3 million uh, Americans quit in the month of August. I believe it was August, yeah. And this is just incredible. Uh, we've never seen numbers like this in the data series going back, you know, to 2000, at least to 2000, probably not even before that. So people are just voluntarily quitting. The majority of these voluntary quits are coming from the food and hospitality industry. People are just fed up with, you know, working. I mean, it's got to be tough, you know, in this environment. Many people 
are, they're just not, they're pretty tough to please in the food and hospitality industry. Uh, healthcare workers are facing all kinds of issues. This is a grueling job and a grueling time. Thank God for all of our health work, healthcare workers out there. Thank God for our teachers. Thank God for all the, the people out there who are, you know, working hard, but it's tough. This is, these are grueling conditions. They're being overworked because there's a, there's a, a deficit in the number of workers that are out there. There's 5 million jobs unfilled. And so when you, when you look at the supply chain, the supply chain is complicated by all of this. And I, for example, I, I have a rent house. I just had to re- replace a window in the rent house. And this is just an example in my own life, but I called the uh, local glass company and I said, I need a new window. And a, the price had went up dramatically since the last time I had done this. And then, you know, maybe a hundred, 150 bucks more than what I normally pay for a window. And the lead time was like a month, you know? So, uh, they, it's just taken a long time to get the glass. I mean, it's the same way, but it, you know, that's just my little, you know, sob story. I mean, there's many worse. I mean, if you're trying to rent a car right now, the lots are practically empty. The choice is very limited. If you're trying to buy a new or a used car right now, it's very tough. If you're trying to buy a house right now, it's tough. If you're trying to buy an appliance like a refrigerator or a washer, anybody in the audience who's trying to buy a refrigerator right now, you're talking about six to 12 months out for that brand new refrigerator for some models. I mean, there's a shortage of skilled workers. If you're trying to hire a plumber, if you're trying to hire uh, an electrician, it's challenging in this environment. And so, you know, all of this is complicated, as I said, by these rising prices. So consumer price index went up about 5.4%. Uh, I want to say it was uh, recently. And this is complicated by uh, the supply chain disruptions and also this massive consumer demand. So consumer demand right now is through the roof. It's about 20% higher than what it was pre-pandemic. A lot of that's revenge spending. So people uh, have been cooped up in their houses. They haven't been spending like they normally did or maybe spending in different ways. Now they're spending with a vengeance, uh, revenge travel, the same thing. So that's just complicating the whole thing. You know, it's just a, it's causing major retailers like Walmart and Costco and Target to actually charter their own ships. Like they're actually buying their, chartering their own container ships on the ocean because the traditional supply chain is just not cutting it for them, especially as we head into the Christmas season. So I think all of this is indicative of the fact that we have a fragile system. Um, and so it builds the case uh, right back to what you were saying for, you know, thinking differently and realizing that grocery stores do not make food. We may end up in a situation where, you know, seeing our supply chain compromise like we have, Elijah, surely an adversary, a foreign adversary realizes our weaknesses. And what if they were to attack our supply chain, which they have certainly done before? But what if they did it in a really meaningful way when we were really weak? How many people could survive, um, you know, a, three days, four days without the grocery store being open or having enough food? I mean, what kind of society is this that has become so dependent upon a supply chain that is obviously so fragile? So it's a wake up call for all of us. And many people are tuning in and they're choosing to leave their their jobs. They, they're 50% of the country right now are considering a reevaluating their life. They're reevaluating their career choice. They're looking for a new job. They're looking for better opportunities. They're moving. They're relocating. So it's a wild time. And I would just say in all of that, uh, the more people who can think about a more sustainable lifestyle, you know, the better. Uh, you know, that's really what I hope is, is going to happen for, for some people, especially in your audience. Really changing your mindset and realizing that what we've experienced in the past, you know, of the comfort and ease that we're used to, that may not be the case uh, for the future. And I did want to kind of on that same topic of like what we're used to is not necessarily what we're going to see in the future. There's also it seems like this growing uh, political divisiveness. Right. And. I don't know if that's one of the things that you're concerned about as well, because, you know, when I when I see that, it's like, well, <laughs> where is that leading? It doesn't seem like it's getting better. And COVID has just brought up a whole lot of different issues and it's been very politicized. Your perspective on that, like where that is heading in the future. This is a topic that is very sad. Um, so many people, Elijah, believe the right left paradigm. Uh 
they want they they live in echo chambers. They want to hear that the other side is bad and that they're right. They don't realize that they're on a Titanic and that the Titanic is sinking and that they're arguing over who the captain is, that they don't quite realize this, I think. They'll realize it later. But right now, there are people who really think that by changing the captain of the Titanic uh, or whatever is or, and duking it out over the – see, what I want, uh, Elijah, is I want, the, I want the lifeboat. I'll let the women and children get on first, but I want to get on one too. I'm, I'm getting off of the boat. I mean the boat is sinking. It's, it's destroyed. It's self-imploded. And who is driving the Titanic? Who is you know in charge of the Titanic? It doesn't really interest me at this point. I'm not really interested in that part. I know many people are. I know many people feel that if we don't get so-and-so in office or if this party has control, that everything is going to go to hell in a handbasket. Uh, I don't view the world that way. I don't sympathize with that. I used to. I used to, you know, I used to, whenever I was younger, I used to listen to Rush Limbaugh and, you know, I also listened to, uh, you know, Sean Hannity and things of this nature. Uh, I've grown up since that time. You know, these are, these are uh, diversions, I think. Uh, that we don't need. They're not healthy. Uh, this is not a healthy environment we've created. This is a very dangerous environment. And the truth is not found in these voices. Uh, this is not the truth. Um, and the squabbling over politics is really just replaced, quite frankly, Elijah, religion. It used to be, you know, back in the 1500s, the people would get into fistfights over you know, Calvinism versus Lutheranism or Calvinism versus Catholicism, you know, today it's, they're upset about Republican versus Democrat. They've just replaced their religion as politics. Uh, my religion is not politics. Uh, you know, I have faith in Christ. I, I have faith in, in God. I, I don't put my faith in politicians. I don't put my faith in government. Uh, my salvation does not come from them. So I realize that there are real questions around this that we can't escape, but the political divisiveness is absolutely part of the downfall of society. And it's very similar to what happened in ancient Rome, where the chaos just ramped up and people just stopped believing facts. We don't believe facts in this country anymore. Uh, we believe what we want to believe, Elijah. We, we believe lies. We believe propaganda. And the propaganda emits, believe it or not, from both sides in equal amounts. So if you believe the right or you believe the left, you believe a lie. Neither one of them are telling you the truth. They're both destroying the nation. They're both l driving up the national debt. They're both destroying the dollar. They're both destroying our culture. They're both antagonizing the, uh, the, the worse, um, or the, the, the evil forces within this country and bringing them to the, to the forefront. We don't need this current political climate right now, but many people think that it's the solution, that one side needs to win. Uh, I don't see it that way. I think it's so key, as you mentioned, kind of opting out of the system, going for that lifeboat is the is really the way to go right now. And it'll be great to have you back on to continue to track the situation and share with us your insights on really how to how to build that life raft. So, Jerry, we really appreciate your time today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where people can find you and your new uh, your website as well? Follow the money. We have a, a special link in the description of this video for viewers who'd like to sign up and along the way be supporting us as well. That's right. When people sign up for followthemoney.com with your special link and use the coupon code Liberty, a pretty good word, uh, they're going to receive um, a discount, but they're also going to be supporting your, your fine work over there. Our members are all over the world, followthemoney.com. We have members all over the place. So if you're listening to this maybe in Europe or you're listening to this in Australia or some other country, even in Asia, you know, you're welcome at followthemoney.com. We have a global audience. We teach people how to invest. We teach them how to uh, create more income. We have live uh, coaching calls each and every week. We coach you along the way. We answer your questions. We have a great support team that's ready to answer your questions. So no matter where you're at in your financial life, uh, whether you're wanting to invest in commodities, currencies, cryptocurrencies, stocks, ETFs, or you're wanting to create more income, we can help. We have resources here that are enormous going back for 10 years. So just go to followthemoney.com and at the very least, check out our free podcast, get our free email 
newsletter. You'll find that right there on the front page of our website, followthemoney.com. Yeah, but if you do decide to become a member, be sure to use the coupon code Liberty so you'll be supporting uh, you know, the uh, Liberty and Finance uh, podcasts and videos and uh, save money at while you're at it. Thanks again, Elijah. I really appreciate being here. Definitely. It's great to have you, Jerry. Once again, thank you so much for your time and God bless. You too. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, Service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs. 